Hello and welcome to the Virtualization Security Podcast um, and Cloud Security pod- Video Podcast, I should say, episode number nine or so, and we are continuing the non-video podcast on um, iTunes and so forth, and this is episode number 150-something, 52, I think. And I'm here with Tal Klein, who has left his security position to join Lakeside Software. What is your role over at Lakeside Software? Uh, I run strategy. I'm VP of strategy, and uh, the two product lines I focus on are our um, our cloud edition, which is basically a SaaS version of of our, our of our legacy uh, on-premises solution, and uh, what we call our uh, risk uh, visualizer, which is basically taking a whole bunch of data that we collect from that we've been collecting over the last almost two decades off of endpoints and applying it to uh, doing risk assessments. And those risk assessments can then be used for security purposes or or whatever need the business has. Yeah, we don't. We have no interest uh, at all in be, being perceived as a security solution. It's just that you know um, the data is there. The, the data is there, and it's pretty interesting actually. Uh, it's not even the, the data itself is less valuable. We're finding than uh, the ability to to uh, monitor deltas. Uh, in in the data, that is the the vector of change, is a lot more valuable than the the actual data that we collect. So, uh, what we're finding is in the context of risk, there's there's two values. The first is just doing a risk assessment, and uh, a lot of companies are using that as a mechanism to sort of try to get. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff they're doing, but uh, my favorite one is um, they're actually going back with our data and negotiating preferred. Cyber insurance premiums from the, <laughs> from uh, insurance companies uh, because they can show that their risk profile is comparisonly to others in, in their um, in their verticals higher or lower. Well, that's actually but it's, it's fairly interesting. Yeah. Actually, it's, it, it, I'm telling you, it, it's kind of fun because you know, Lakeside is a company where we have uh, I, I call it a Leatherman because it's not a Swiss Army knife. It's it's a Leatherman, and it, it solves a lot of these you know very very specific points. Uh, uh, trouble points that people have it with enterprise IT but every time I talk to a customer there's like some unique use case that I've never heard of before and then if I go back and ask other customers about it they're like oh yeah of course like like I should have just known like I think that we have less visibility into how people use our product uh, than our than our customers it's kind of interesting but but anyway going back to this risk thing so you're saying you, the first one is just establishing a risk profile and saying what am I comfortable with but from a risk management perspective for the security team we're able to tell them, hey, you know, this laptop represents today the most risk to your enterprise because its risk score has risen by the greatest vector. And so go investigate stuff there. You know, we'll show them some things they should care about. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, we'll tell them what to, go, you know, what to go investigate and, and they'll, you know, they'll actually go and figure it out. It's kind of interesting. It's really, really interesting the way that they do it. So it's uh, actually very cool. But yeah. we're actually going to be talking about something entirely different. I mean, lowering your insurance costs is a, a godsend because the stuff is getting very, very expensive given all the breaches yes. we have today. And this is a good segue is that how would you normally do that if you're using the cloud today? If I was right. going into the cloud or have a cloud, what's the one thing for free that anybody can do to better secure their administrative side of the shop? And then let's turn that around and say, okay, I'm a, I have workloads running in the cloud. How can I help those out? How can I secure those as well? So, free uh, always has a cost. I think you know. Yeah, I think well, it's, it's always a, a cost, complexity <laughs> cost, or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think it's free. Let's let's just say the the uh, the least expensive rather than free. And I think uh, you 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 know, and uh, when we kind of did the the pre-interview, we talked a little bit about two-factor, and I think we should address that. Uh, I think another one is education, uh, which is worth, uh, you know, which is also worth spending some time on. But again, when you talk about education, it's like, what are you educating? Well, you, I would, what I would do is I would work backwards from uh, the primary attack vectors, right? And so I, th- I think that what we constantly see, and, and this is a favorite topic of mine, you know, what we constantly see is that uh, the, the biggest likelihood of an attack will come through uh, compromised credentials so Absolutely. phishing you know and and yeah I think at this point everybody knows to look out for for suspicious emails and it's 
I care less about the suspiciousness of the emails. And what, I, what I'm trying to, you know, when I did this, I did this program here actually at, at Lakeside. And I took everybody and said, look, think about less about does this really look like the Bank of America logo or the, the Citibank logo or whatever. And, and think instead about what is the information that I'm being asked to convey, right? So exactly. why would Google, like why would Google ask me to authenticate again? If I'm already logged into Gmail, why would why would Google ask me to authenticate again? Not not so much, you know, look inside well, your browser. They ask you, and, and would they ask you to authenticate over mail? Yeah, over mail or yeah. The, so you're you're logged you. into Gmail. They would not right. authentic ask you to reauthenticate by sending you an email. They would ask you to reauthenticate by popping up a box. And there would be a reason for it. Ultimately, exactly. that's what I'm saying. Like there would be a reason for it. Like there's no such thing as arbitrary. Uh, um, authentication, you know, and yeah. uh, if there is, it's an anomaly. And, and, I, and, and, so I try to, and you never get it over email anyways. Right, email or phone. Right, so so I think it's more about, you know, uh, situational awareness, and that's, a, that's the sort of stuff that I think you can train. Okay. You, you, I, I don't agree think you with can, you. Yes, yeah, so I, I don't think you can train for what does a phishing email look like. I think what you can train for is what is information that should raise a red flag. Like when somebody asks you for what, you know, you know, like you could say, like if somebody asks you for your social security number, you should think twice about it, right? Like in real life, you kind of do. Uh, or actually, I, guess I never I've kind give of it up. Yeah, in I mean, real life, people <laughs> ask me for it I'm all the time. Saying, actually, actually, I, I, I'm a bad example of that because I think just just today I probably gave it out like three times. But um, I think that you know that there are some things in the context of business where we really need to uh, kind of educate users on what's what is important. And and what is the and more importantly, like what is the context uh, that you might be asked for specific information? So let's talk about two factor for a second. I mean, every almost every cloud has it. Yes. And if you, your cloud doesn't have it, you can get it through Google Google Authenticator and hook that sure. in. Sure. But two factor's gone and is metamorphosized into something that I don't think is two factor. Okay. Yeah, we talked about that as well. Yeah, I want to hear I want to hear your theory before I attack it. <laughs> 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 Two factors, something yeah. you have, something you know, and something you are. One of those factors has to be part of it. The fact is, is that modern two-factor says, okay, log in, and we'll send you an SMS. Or we'll send you something to your phone. Well, I'm logging in on something I have, and you're sending me something I should know to something I have. Right. Which means that any thief that can emulate this or take it or steal it or steal the credentials off it now has the SMS. So it's not two factor. It's one factor. One factor being this device. I would rather it be something else I carry than that device. Because if you have that one device, then game over. But the problem is, you know, when you start to do stuff like that, you're asking the users to... Um... It doesn't to have to be. It doesn't have to be that device. It could be another device that you already carry with you. Maybe, maybe. I, I, again, it's just. Uh, I I like the. So here's here's what I would like. I would like it if enterprises starting out handing out like desirable things like an Apple Watch. Let's say. Let's say you get an Apple Watch from work, and in return, okay, I'm saying, but in return, you know that that becomes your. So then the company's paying a fee. Like they're, and they're giving the they're giving the user perceived value. In return, the user is willing to then participate in the security schema of the organization. That is, I don't think it's never enough. I think a lot of people in the security industry uh, have the wrong uh, preconceived notion that uh, threat of being fired or disciplined in some way is enough to to keep employees compliant. No, it's not. And I, they don't. Care. And I, think that, yeah, exactly. They don't care. And, and by the way, they're more important than a lot of times to the to the day to day running of the business, especially if it's a salesperson, he's not gonna you know you're not you're not gonna ever get in a situation where like they'll they'll say, Would you rather I bring in a million dollar deal or log in securely? You know, because it's not fair. It's not a fair question to ask. Actually of the given that the current breaches have been hundreds of millions of dollars of fines, hundreds of millions of dollars of lost revenue, hundreds of millions of dollars of bad will. You but know, who are you asking? You see that you're asking the like... wrong question. <laughs> if you're okay. going to someone saying you got to log in securely or you lose that deal, they're never going to say that. They're going to say keep the deal because the business needs to right. keep running. But 
I should never be asking that question. <laughs> That's the wrong question to ask. In my mind, if I'm going, for administrative purposes, an admin has to use two-factor authentication. Just do it. It's free. It doesn't hurt you. Just make sure you don't have it sent in SMS. If you're logging in over your phone, don't have it reply to your phone. Log in some other place and then have the SMS go to your phone. But also make sure that phone is not on the same proxy network, the same network as the other device because of proxy attacks and all those types of things. Well, it, it, I mean, there's, there's, a lot there's, of, two ways. there's a lot of things you have to worry about from an awareness perspective when you're doing this with a phone or something like that. The, the way I've been describing it when I when I, I, I do my little dog and pony show is I, I say that basically two factor is the seatbelt of Yes. Uh, security now. So I think it's like, you know, yeah, ha having two factor do exponentially increases, uh, sorry, decreases your attack surface, you know, and it's nice. It's nice to have. So, you know, is, you know, my dad is a good example of someone who was brought up in the generation, you know, before before seatbelts. And so, like, if he gets in the car with me, he would rather hear the thing beep at him over and over and over again than put the seatbelt on because that's his perception of comfort. Yeah. Whereas in my case, you know, I understand implicitly the value of the seatbelt, so I put it on without before, before it ever gets a chance to beep. Like I've already been trained, you know what I mean? I've already yes. been trained to understand the value of the seatbelt and why why I need to have it and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, I think that I think we're, we're I think that we what we're getting at is. There's the value to having the capability, such as two-factor authentication, and I actually do agree with you that if you're able to truly separate it into the uh, uh, something you know, something you have, um, then uh, then that's effective because a lot of these proxy attacks will try to do both. They'll try to say they'll try to actually you know spoof your uh, your sample token, and then uh, by getting you to to, have, to give me your password and then also spoof the two-factor piece, which is the code. And you enter the code, they keep the session alive and log in on your behalf concurrently, right? That's a session and, attack. And yes, exactly. Those can happen. And and I'm saying until um, until everybody uses two-factor, the two-factor will continue to provide exponential value. I think at some point that's going to probably reduce once the attackers just make this, once they 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 add that component to every single attack, I think that um, the next thing to really think about is to properly, you know, the, the the thing that we haven't done successfully to date, and I think this a lot of this does fall on the enterprises side, is identifying data that that is valuable and segmenting that away from, uh, you know, um, the, less the, valuable. The yeah. old data classification story. It's difficult, you know. I just set up, so I just built a new house, and um, I, I, you know, what I did is uh, everything in my house is IoT. So my fridge is internet connected, my, you know, my thermostat is inter internet connected, my lights are internet connected. I've got Sonos everywhere. I've got Alexa controlling Sonos through a Smart Things hub. Like I've got, I, my house is just uber connected. And but I did have to think a lot about, uh, you know, properly segmenting them. So these things, yes. you know, my car is a Volt, so it's an it's an OnStar car, so I can remote start it from wherever I want. You know, I've got, um, you know, and, and so I had to actually properly segment access to things based on their importance. So, um, you know, like I, I never need, for example, Sonos is a good example. Like I, I I never need to control Sonos when I'm not at home. Right. You know what I mean, I, so there's no reason that, that Sonos should ever have access outside the home. Or I, uh, well, and the same thing is like outside. some of the stuff I do with my IoT is the same way. Is like, do I need access to that outside the home? No. Can I access it if I can get into my home over a VPN? Absolutely. Right. So, so but there's so then, the further segmentation says even on a VPN you should not be able to. Well, so so, but then I think of my users, which is like my daughters and my wife, right? Who who don't want to know. <laughs> any of this stuff right they just want to be able to turn the volume up when when they want to turn the volume up they want my wife when she's so we have we use um we have a, a an rfid system in the fridge specifically based on um to, for inventory purposes and so when, when we go shopping we know what we're out of like basic essentials like bread and milk so and no like i i thought an iot um, 
refrigerator would say, I agree with your wife, you weigh too much. I'm sorry, I'm not opening <laughs> after 8 p.m. Well, <laughs> yes, that's, uh, you know, I, my I wife would it. like that refrigerator, but. Uh, no, we just have this basic Samsung thing. It has like these little, you, you, yeah. put, you put these uh, uh, little rings on things and each ring has corresponding value to it. So, uh, you know, we know when we're out of milk because the the, R, the the RFID tag for milk is not in the fridge. It's a, pro, it's a process of, of, of uh, information through elimination. Um, so, but again, so she needs to be able to do this stuff. She wants to be able to find out what we don't have when she's in the supermarket or whatever. And... That I'm giving her, and that app has privileged access to the house because it's accessing a device that is on on the network in the house. Now the onus is on me as the administrator, right, to account for my end user's apathy to security. Well, in, in home use is one thing, enterprise use is another thing, and to be honest, I'm not sure they're different. My whole yeah. thing about education has been I need to teach my users situational awareness i need to teach them what's what's happening around them how to pay attention to it what to think about but security people and every edu every other computer educational system in the world everything we've done to date has been dead wrong there's only one yeah. organization in my mind that gets it right and it's not one most people come across it's the opsec okay. people inside the government because they're not thinking about computers, they're thinking right. about people. How do you keep yourself safe? If I, you can keep yourself from be, self safe, you will keep us safe. Right? right. And the thing is, it's like if I we we should be teaching people how to protect their money. We should be teaching teaching people how to protect their kids. Right. How to protect their home. If we can do that and teach them safety about themselves, I'll guarantee you that they're going to insist upon that same level of security inside the organization. Yeah, you're touching on a very interesting point, uh, which I, I don't know how far it's been it's been tried, but you know, I, I think that's that's actually fairly astute. You know, we started by saying, you know, what if what if a way to get IT to to um, incentivize the user to participate in information security is by giving them uh, access to to security things that, that they may not have a, have access to or did, like for example yeah, you, you would, with the guy I watch you were gamifying and saying you do this will give you right. this nice thing and, you know I'm not sure that really works because they just use that nice thing badly yeah I mean, but you know again you've got the capabilities of doing you know uh, I don't know I don't know how you feel about things like EMM for example but I don't you know, like you did, it I don't think it's worth yeah. it yeah, I think there's a. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, it's the reason why I don't think it's worth it is because I use I, this device is mine. It has pictures on it and voicemails on it that I cannot afford to lose. Now, it behooves me to make sure that those things are backed up, and I do that regularly because we've gone through multiple phones and a couple of voicemails from people that no longer are alive that I want to keep so I can hear their voice. So I can remember them. If I went into an organization with BYOD and I signed up for the security stuff and they removed that on me when they wiped my phone remotely, I would be really, 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 really upset. Yeah, I mean, that you happened. Basically a good of mine. now had security invade my life. No, that, that, that happened to a good friend of mine, actually. Um, this is, I don't know if I can mention his name. Well, let me give you the scenario. He basically left a, a job uh, and was using, um, was backing up his, his, it was actually iTunes. I mean, less less sensitive stuff than yours, um, I would say, but, you know, music. Uh, yeah. And he was backing up stuff to uh, to his work machine. Um, and, uh, you know, when, uh, when he left, you know, they basically d disabled his ability to, to sync as soon as he announced that he was leaving. And so he could not restore his iTunes backup. Well, and that's the problem. You should not be putting your personal stuff on business equipment. But Don't you, do yeah, it. It's, yeah. It's, it, it, Edward, the thing that you and I constantly, I feel like you expect way too much from <laughs> users. Like I, I, you, have to, you have to pretend that you know, you're like a first grade teacher 
you know. And well, that, no, that's I agree. The way, I, I agree. Yeah, but this is, exactly. again, situational awareness, things you shouldn't be doing. You and I both <laughs> know it. And the problem is, is how do you, you educate? You know, it, but I know, like, how do we, I'm just, you know, I just, I would be grateful for, uh, the, you know, I, I, for example, the whole stranger danger thing, right? Like, I would be grateful if my daughter, you know, actually picked up all these lessons and we actually do practice, we actually practice it, stuff like that, you know, and, you know, but in reality, I, you know, who knows, and, you know, humans are so, um, we, we, we're so human. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're like it's a we, we it's we're arbitrary. So, so in the right moment, in the right context, well, well, let's, let's you know, about you, this. How nobody do we... makes a mistake, and so we have to build we have to build security um, around humanity rather than the other way around. You well, know, and, and, and until we, and I agree with yeah. you, I agree with you, but we also need to stop saying security, blah blah blah, in training classes. Yes. You've got to say, yes. I mean, you start, you got to stop writing the password on the whiteboard. You got to stop using password as the password. You got to stop doing all the things that you don't want people to do, especially in a security <laughs> class. Don't tell them, you're gonna, tell don't you, tell them I, to do I, something and then do the complete I don't opposite. Know. I don't know if that's possible. Like, I, you know, it's, I, I moved, I, I moved from, from here to, to Michigan and, uh, and, we went to the bank because our, our bank doesn't have because Wells Fargo doesn't have a presence in in, in Michigan. Okay, so we were like inter, we were going to, to meet with banks to figure out what banks what bank we're going to move our accounts to, and I'm having this conversation. I'm not going to name names with which bank it was, but I'm sitting there with their like you know whatever the VP of something something, and he's like, oh okay, let me, um, you know, let me uh, take a look at. Uh, I guess he was looking at some funds that I had. And then he literally his password for his machine, it was on his phone, like on his, on, <laughs> like I, I can see it. <laughs> I was like, you know, and it was the funniest thing. And then, um, not only that, he started pointing out it and, and, and like different investments. I was talking about the Vanguard uh, dividend portfolio or stuff like that. And I actually we started getting into it. And he let me. He's like, oh, why don't you just show me? And he gave me the mouse and keyboard for his computer, you know. And this guy has. I mean, it's. It, so I'm logged into his machine as him, you know, and easily could have switched accounts. Sorry, like it was just, it's unbelievable. A, that is a so. bank I would refuse to do business with, and I would explain. I know I did, and I, did. I would no, explain saying, why I, I would refuse to do business with him. I, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't want to lecture him. But I basically decided. No, I would, I, mean, I, I, would I would have said you don't take security go, seriously yeah. enough for me. I'm sorry, I cannot do business with you. Well, he was actually complaining to me. That's what I'm saying. So he, what he was saying is like things. It takes me so long to log in because of the security things, and I have to input this and I have to input that. And I'm like, and he's like, and he's like, but well, don't worry, I've got it all written down, so I fast tracked. <laughs> I was like, oh, great, great. I'm glad you, I'm glad you found a way. But again, the reason he did that is because the security process was taking too long, right? And so, was it the security it process? Is... It wasn't the security process that was taking too long, to be honest. It was the lack of the ability to memorize things and remember things that are key and critical to his job. And that's no, why it was that difficult. I could, you know, I could replay this conversation. You know, I actually, I, 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 I sympathized and empathized with him a little bit because their password retention policy is something like nine days, something that's ridiculous like that. a less. So, that's a little small. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. And, 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 and I know what they're thinking. The security team is probably seeing like all this bad behavior and they're trying to, to counteract the bad behavior by, you know, forcing them to do things. But then they don't realize that, that the, the, the humanity of it. That's what I mean. Like if we don't think about the humanity of, of the of the person at the other end of the computer, then whatever it is we design, our security policies will will is it will fall apart. Well, and, it's, it's simple. Uh, I mean, if you go, if you have a grandmother alive or a, 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 an older person, an older person in your family as a security person, you go to them and say, how would you like if we did this? And if they say that gets in my way, don't do it. Right. Because those that's the level you're talking about. People that don't understand computing are the ones using the computers and you can't force them to do something you don't want them to do. Because if you do force them, they're just going to pick up a yet another bad habit. Right. Well, actually, that, that's why I really liked it when I was working at, at Bromium. Is that, you know, I basically put Bromium on all my family's computers, and it like solved like everything, <laughs> all the problems. Now I had to buy them high-end computers. Like, it was a cost to me. 
it was a cost to me because at the time, I don't know, I really don't know where Bromium is right now, but it used to be you, know, you really needed a high end machine. But I you just do. bought it. Something I would buy, bought it because the, the personal cost to me, every time my mom would call me and I would find out that she installed like, you know, infinite malware onto her machine trying to download Smiley toolbars, uh, that that a personal cost to me. So I was happy to spend, you know, an extra grand on hardware to to solve that problem for myself, you know, and then I, I, from that point on, it was great. The saddest thing about leaving Bromium is I put, is that having to deal with, with the family support calls again and becoming the, because uh, the, there's just so much bad stuff out there, you know, and, and it is you, I mean, absolutely horrible. I, I try, I tried to educate, I tried to educate so much and I'm like so patient about this kind of stuff, but you know, the, the way malware is constructed today, Especially adware, the way adware is constructed, and I feel adware is essentially malware these days, um, is it makes you feel like it makes an end user feel like they're not getting the full message from an end, from, a, from a friend if they don't install this application. So you'll get something from uh, like my mom's my mom's co teachers. She's at this uh, university, um, and and they. The museum actually, so she, they they send her these emails with the smileys in it. But if she doesn't have the smiley toolbar, the then instead of rendering the smileys, it says to see the full message, install smiley toolbar, whatever it's called, yeah. right? And and so she feels so she's being tricked into thinking that she's missing some important information, right? And that's the way they do and, things. I mean, that's that's yeah. it, it's all playing on human 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 emotion. Human so I'm saying, so when need. we design security, like we have to, we have to take into that account. I think, like for example, Google does a really good job of that. You know, the way that they actually classify data and and use, uh, you know, Gmail to me ha, is as good as it's going to get for a long time. You know, I I don't and know what gets 100%. better. It's not 100%. Right, it's not 100, percent but it's better. It's so much better than than it used to be, you know. And um, well, it's not just Gmail. I, I, you got, I mean, if you think about anybody that has a a global to, um, um, engine to pick up malware and find it and respond to it quickly, will actually do a really good job. I mean, to be honest, the Barrac Barracuda does a fairly good job too. If you yeah, or just one. the basic Microsoft stuff works fine. I mean, yeah. the, the Whatever, but yeah, none of these I, I, are hundred. None of these are hundred percent, and you still need to keep your eye on. I mean, the one thing I tell my tell people that I'm working with in my family is just don't click on anything inside of a message. Just don't. If you do, fine, but <laughs> try not to. You don't need try to. Not. And I finally got to through a few people that's that constantly. It's like no, you just don't. Yeah. Well, and, I think I completely agree. I, I, you know. I, and I think that, um, you know, the way the way I position it, you know, is I just accept, I accept that things are going to go wrong, and, and whenever that they do, I try to spend a little bit of time. So if they're going to make me spend an hour, you know, cleaning up their mess, I'm going to explain to them exactly what they did wrong, and at least, hopefully, that that will stick. You know, hopefully, that well, one explanation. I mean, will it, stick. You tie it to something. You got to tie this explanation to something that means something to them. For example. My mom's bank accounts mean a lot to her because of what happens. She how right. she uses them. She needs it to survive. She, money is kind of a main driver for adults because we need it to survive. You lose your money, you lose your lively, you lose the ability to survive. It's really that simple. So if you click on something in a malware in in an email that you shouldn't be clicking on, you could lose all your money, and that could goes exponentially higher and higher the more you do it until it's a reality. When you start talking about kids though, it's the whole stranger danger. So we were talking about, you know, how we need to tie the response we want to something that they don't want to happen. That's right. one way to do this. Adults, you can tie it to money, you can tie it to other things. Kids, you gotta tie it to safety or, or getting hurt or something else that means something to them. That's, I think, the key. And until we do that, we're not thinking about the people, we're thinking about um, ourselves, our, our enterprise that means nothing to anybody. And I think the enterprise needs to start training people to do that. I mean, take a book out of, if you've ever been to an OPSEC course from the government, 
for like the military, part of it's cyber, part of it's not. It is all about situation awareness, what's happening around you, what you say, where you say it, things you should and should not be talking about. I mean, most of the attacks today are almost all the a lot of them are based on, you know, what I heard at a bar. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's the start of it. Well, I mean, we, you, we see a lot of attacks today just even, even happen over Twitter and over Facebook. And I mean, it, it just they, they happen where people are, you know, I mean, it's it. it Attackers are, are opportunistic, you know what I mean? Absolutely. They're going to where the opportunity is. Don't so, give uh, them the opportunity. Right. That That's that's really all what it's all about, you know, it's about keeping that. And there's that nothing a security team can do more than train their people. I mean, there is no tool that they can go right. off. Right. Well, so, so that's, where, that's where you and I agree. I mean, I, I think that's for sure. And I think that if you amortize that cost, that's why I like, you know, people often ask me, like, what my favorite security uh, company is and I, I I say fish me you know that company fish me yeah they because they they basically train people on how to avoid being fished and if you can do that I mean it doesn't matter what antivirus you're running what advanced next generation firewall you're running what you know DLP whatever ultimately the the biggest thing is don't give the keys to the bad guys yeah you know? and so, don't even give them an, a, a chink in the armor right I mean when you look at me on on Twitter and on Skype and everything, the chance of me talking about anything personal is about, oh, no. <laughs> Why? Because I don't do that. The other thing is, I mean, think about this way. How do you protect your home? How do you protect your family? Think about from that perspective. But at the same time, enterprises have to do something besides just training, and they will. And if they're doing anything in the cloud, the administrators, not the worker bees, not that sales guy you were talking about earlier, but the administrators need to take on an extra burden. They need to employ proper two-factor authentication for the administrative angles. While, it's, to me, it's kind of like this. I mean, a lot of these tools, the next generation of tools, are really looking at usage patterns and saying, okay, if that usage pattern is abnormal, let's raise a red flag or raise another authentication mechanism to me that's acceptable because you're letting the user do what they normally do and if something is not quite right or they're trying to get to a place they don't belong it's easy enough to say hey sorry you don't have the authentication get there go talk to your manager yeah i i agree and i think that, uh <laughs> yeah i think that what we're actually starting to see is the landscape for security is shifting away from security and and more towards like you know risk you know what I mean? Which is, kind of, that's why I really like the idea of taking the, you know, the, at least the, the approach that we're taking is because, you know, preventative is 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 a losing battle. I think that, I mean, I think that you're going to have a certain amount of good enough. Uh, every so often, somebody will come by and disrupt an industry, like there's a company called uh, uh, Silence that I really like that basically does. Yes, yeah, Silence uh, is interesting. You know, they have a very, very fresh approach to, to AV. And um, so I, I think that will come along, but I think more important right now is uh, with with the amount of data being generated by the enterprise reaching, you know, exponentially rising year over year, you really, the best thing you could do is give security a clue as to where to look. Yes. You know what I mean? And, and that's that's interesting. That's more interesting to me. I think that, that, that um, once you start to share that data, to share risk data, um, then you've got something of like you're actually able to participate um, in the global discussion about what is dangerous and what isn't. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I want to do. You know, as part of like our, our security thing, um, for example, I'll, I'll give you something that, that I think has interesting ramifications. So we have, we can tell you the first time a binary that's never been run in your organization before is executed. We can create an alert based on that. Now, what I would like to do is not only tell you about that binary that are that, that executed, but I would like to know, have we ever seen it in any of our customers? Have we ever seen this particular binary? Um, and then maybe even do something like plug it into an AV vendor's uh, uh, API. If you have like a you know, good AV, then you know, does this match anything you know, that you have, have in your... Seen it? Yeah. 
But a lot of these things aren't binaries anymore. A lot of them is just third party scripting and so forth mm -hmm. that, you know, you download when you hit the page, you hit it. I mean, I saw one recently where they were actually embedding commands into the UA, hoping it would be executed. Yeah, you could do that. So, so there's also like, for example, uh, one of the things you could tell is why is Edward running RegEdit, you know, for the first time today? And what was he doing in RegEdit? You know what I mean? Like, exactly. Th there's specific there's specific things you could you could pay attention to that don't necessarily mean a security breach but represent a, um, a change to the risk for profile to risky behavior on a on a daily basis okay tell this is not actually working right now hold on a second so what we're talking about is that the tools exist to measure risk. The tools exist to tell you if something's ri a risky behavior or if something is different. I mean, there's a number of different tools out there that will plug into any cloud to tell you behavior has changed. There's tools like that you guys have to tell me that behavior has changed. And I need to now tie that to risk assessment, maybe even um, some more education or whatnot. I mean, there's a lot more to security than just applying a tool, in my mind. Yes, security, as you said, I think number one is operational security. Focus on OPSEC. Uh, number two, focus on tools that don't require interaction from the end user or don't add any friction to their daily workload. And number three is, I think, uh, information sharing, you know, which is, you know, uh, share what you know with 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 birds of a feather and, and the security community Absolutely. Um, in order to decrease everybody's attack surface. And if you are doing an educational program, for, teach people how to protect themselves. They'll insist on that same level of protection in the organization is my, my thought on this. Because if you can teach people to protect themselves, their family and their money, you know, they're going to think, okay, my job is my money. I now need to protect it like that. You know, or other things, or the, or these people are part of my growing family. I need to protect them, and they need to protect me. I th I think that's a good approach to it. I don't know anybody doing it yet, other than perhaps some of the governments. I think uh, probably the, the, there's a few companies I've seen that that do it um, really well. I think ADP is a good example of a company who's really got their act together. Uh, I think um, uh, Bank of New York Mellon. There's another company that's really got their security act together. Um, but yeah, usually most people don't. <laughs> most people don't. Yeah. True. Well, Tal, thank you very much for being on the Virtualization Security Podcast. And I look forward to talking to you more. Thank you. And I'm sorry about my bad connection, but I truly enjoyed speaking with you again.